it, uh, it's an honor for me to introduce uh, Monica Ponce de Leon tonight. Uh, she's uh, a longtime colleague, a uh, good friend, uh, and on a kind of personal note, she, she and her office, Office Da, which you all know their work, um, you know, when you're practicing architecture, there are firms that you constantly look at, your colleagues that you constantly look at, and they serve as kind of inspiration and also as kind of drivers to make sure that you're doing good work. They tend to make your work better. And for us, uh, Office Da is, is kind of one of those types of colleagues, which is, which is very important to us. Um, Monica, Monica's uh, sort of a super person. Um, just the chronology since she graduated from, from Harvard in 1991 has been pretty quick. Um, she graduated in 91. Uh, she started her office with Nader Tarani in 1991. Forget this internship, IDP stuff. It's it's you know she just started right up. Um, started teaching at Harvard, became a full professor, uh, was director of the digital lab there, made a huge impression. At the same time that she was teaching there, and around the country, uh, Office Da was growing, uh, winning awards every year. I mean. I actually had somebody in my office go through and list the number of awards every year that they've won. And I, and I mean, you know, it's crazy. You know, 1995, only one. 1996, two. 97, one. Okay. 2002, 11. Uh, 2008, 16. 16 awards. There used to be a joke in our office where, you know, right before the PA awards would come out every year, we'd sort of make a joke, uh, you know, asking ourselves, like, I wonder who's going to win a PA award besides Office Da, because everybody knew that they were going to win one, and I think it's 12 now. So um, needless to say, uh, Office Da has become uh, uh, a significant firm, a very influential firm, an international firm. In fact, I was speaking, or I was emailing with Galia Salmanoff today, who's in Argentina at a conference, and she emailed back and said, tell Monica hello, and also tell her that her work has been referenced in this conference several times today, so th in Argentina today. So this is, you know, this, this, is a, this is a significant firm, one that if you haven't studied their work, you should. It, it's, it's, and, it, and the work they're getting is starting to grow, get larger, uh, and, and starting to take on much, much more significant and urgent issues. One other little story, then I'll let Monica talk, but um, you know, their work has always been associated with sort of advanced techniques, materiality, digital techniques. Um, but one project that I, I'm particularly interested in and kind of uh, impressed with is the Fleet Library they did at Rhode Island School of Design. And it's a beautiful project. Most of you have probably seen it. But what's really fascinating about it is that it, they designed it with the understanding that at some point it was going to be taken down, right? In other words, it's th they're starting to develop, I think, an attitude about their work that understands the long-term consequences of what we do as architects. And I think this is something that, that is uh, 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 a powerful uh, kind of way to think about it as a designer. And, and uh, these are the kind of issues that, that Monica, uh, with her practice, uh, is starting to take on. 2008, she becomes dean at the um, School of Architecture at University of Michigan. Now, this is a big school. Um, having taught there, it's a fantastic school. So Monica now is the dean of a school in addition to running this powerful practice. I don't know how she does it, but she does. And if you read her dean statement, uh, which I would encourage you to because it's incredibly inspiring. Uh, it's very ambitious. And from everything that I hear, uh, these things are starting to happen at Michigan. Uh, the school is changing. Monica's making a huge difference. And I think she's starting to uh, take all of the, the kind of years of thinking that has evolved in her praxis, practice and in teaching, but now taking it to a point where she's leading a school. So with that, it's an honor to introduce you, Monica, and please join me in welcoming Monica Ponce de Leon. I'm totally embarrassed. It is thrilling for me to be here today. This is my first time lecturing here at Columbia. 
and I am not only among friends and colleagues, but people whose work I have followed very closely and who has served as a measure for the development of our own uh, work. And um, it is true that uh, our trajectory has sort of moved very quickly. I think we have been very lucky um, to have a team around us that really supports the work. So what the work that I'm gonna show today is the result of many, many, many long hours worked by many, many more people than just me. And the same is true actually of my work at the University of Michigan. We have very much a team approach to the leadership to the point that I don't necessarily think of myself as a dean. I think of um, me as having, as being part of a leadership team with associate deans and chairs as well. Um, so, and you'll see me during the, the um, presentation sometimes distinguish between we and I. So when I, when I say we, I really mean the team. And sometimes I will talk about when I may have dissented from the opinion of the colleagues I was working with, or when I actually felt something was particularly important to me personally. So I'm going to do something a little unusual tonight in that I am going to not show one or two projects in great detail. Instead, I'm going to show fragments um, of a myriad of projects to, in a way, put in context the um, sort of the trajectory of our work. In the last year or so, I've been thinking a lot about the overall project in relationship to uh, the discipline of architecture. I feel very strongly that the discipline is undergoing fundamental changes. And I think when I compare where we are today as to when we were, uh, where the discipline was, when I came out of school, the, the, the change is quite dramatic. I think it's a different discipline. I think it's a different field. But I think the changes in the next few years are gonna happen even more rapidly. Um, we have, I've entitled the lecture Approximations, and it's always difficult to give titles to lectures because you end up lecturing months after you give a title. But I think it's still relevant to my thinking today. I used to be very interested in the notion of precision and in the idea of being um, very directed in the way that we thought about facts, material facts, and how they precisely materialized into buildings, spaces, and programs. In the last few years, and maybe it's because I'm getting old, I am moving away from this fascination with the precise, and I'm actually more fascinated with confronting the reality that our discipline is more about sort of near misses, coming close, approximating, and that you actually have to not only be comfortable with this notion, that you never really get that thing that you're after, um, but that is actually what we do as architects. So our work has um, been really, um, how can I say this, directed. We have thought of things as never being left to chance and never being left to the more or less. So for example, when we have worked at the smaller scale, as is in the case of furniture, we very precisely calibrated how much we would carve out of a block of wood, um, stack of plywood, as a way of getting the hand in a drawer so that you could pull it. And this then became the motif, the element that will define this piece of furniture. And in addition, it became sort of the decoration of the, of the object. So for us, program and the decorative have always been intersected. So having alibis that justify multiple descriptions, multiple explanations of everything within a project has been fundamental to us. The, in this particular case, we also work with the notion of creating a different effect. Normally, when you see a chest of drawers, the structure is apparent, the structure is outside of it, so that you see the frame that holds the pieces. We were interested in the idea of stacking drawers, so the conventional structural system of the drawers needed to be somehow suppressed and recessed. Now, for a while, we thought of digital technology as something that allowed us to work with what we call zero tolerances. 
This is a project from 1996 that we designed in 1996 and got constructed in 98, very, very early on. We were fascinated with the use of the water jet and the precision that the water jet, water jet uh, allowed us. So we devised the piece so that the program, simple programs that occur around it, like for example, sitting in a bench or using it underneath as a way of frame, framing uh, artwork along a wall, or the idea of a canopy, becoming a canopy on the street to announce the exhibition. This was an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art, so this is the street behind the museum. All of these different programs for us came together in the construction of the object. By the same token, we were interested with something that was not, uh, we were interested in something that was not architectural the idea of producing a piece of architecture based on our sort of secret fantasy of working with origami. And I'm sure that many of you may have, been, may, have ha may have similar obsessions, but the idea of thinking of metal as a sheet of paper that can be folded. So these five strips are the five strips that, could, that constitute the entire uh, piece. So it was designed in three dimensions and then flattened for fabrication. But the reality of construction is very different. We were working with the ideal sheet size of 40 feet long. We didn't have a budget to work with that. We needed to work with scraps found in, this, uh, in the fabricator shop. So what you see on the left is the actual sizes that we had available, which meant that it couldn't be built purely by five strips. It needed to be built with smaller elements. Now the beauty of that for us is that it led actually to the addition of a different level of detailing, the detailing that is really related to its making, the detailing that moves it away from some abstract concept to what I would say is actually architecture. At the same time, we started working with the problem of folding. How do you actually take a sheet of steel and then fold it? And again, we looked outside of architecture at something as simple as cardboard boxes and we used the language that we understood from the cardboard box as a way of wrapping and folding the steel around itself. The difference in the cardboard box though, and all of you have moved so all of you know how this works, is that when you cut the box to so that the material can give so that you can actually fold it, those cuts aligned. Steel does not have the flexibility of cardboard so we needed to offset the cuts in the material, and the offset is actually the thickness of the metal itself. Oops, going too fast. So the piece was digitally fabricated, but yet it was folded and assembled by hand. The precision afforded to us by digital technology allowed us to sort of complete one more fantasy, which is the notion that something that is geometrically complex could actually be understood as a very simple figure from one point of view within the museum. So we designed that based on an old, old Baroque technique of anamorphosis, so that from a single point of view, it will flatten out and be reconstituted as a single sheet. But of course, embedded within this idea is the notion of depth, so that even within flatness, depth can be understood. Now, what about zero tolerance and what about precision? The lesson that we learned in this case is that how you fabricate actually impacts the idea of the project as well. The piece was fabricated in two halves, and the dimension of the house was predicated on the diagonal size of the door at the fabricator's office. They were transported in flat beds and then brought to the street behind the museum with the idea that this crane will then lift it and place it in the courtyard itself. Now you have to understand we were in our, I, I was in my late 20s and my partner was in his early 30s, very nervous we had the museum curator shocked that we have closed the street. We did it with a permit, but the clock was running. We only had about five hours to install it. So as we were putting the two pieces together, what happened is that they did not match. Can somebody tell me why they didn't match? They 
the bending wear. Anybody? Okay. Well, I have to tell you, we spent about three hours trying to figure this out, and we couldn't figure it out. So we finally just decided to go get a drink. <laughs> and in the middle of having drinks, me and the fabricator, who is an artist, is, this is Alex Kevetan, we realized the street is not flat. So while our piece is absolutely straight and perfect, the street itself is not flat. So of course, once we figured that out, we put a car jack at this end and we just pumped it up until it lined up and we were home free. Now, the irony of the story is that we had accounted for the problem of the context not being perfect in the, in the, in the sense that we had developed a system of overlap for the columns that held the piece in situ. And what you see here is that this is actually one sheet of steel, this is another sheet of steel, they overlap and they wrap around each other, and then these bolts were actually placed on site. So we had already accounted for the problem of zero tolerance not being a reality, but only something that we could approximate. But somehow we forgot about the street outside. So we have been very interested in this relationship between the inner workings of a building, the inner workings of an object, the inner workings of space, and the final figure of a building, or the final figure of an object. You saw it in the dresser, you saw it in the MoMA piece. We're also interested in these final figures being, having multiple interpretations and having multiple expressions. So when we were asked to do to design this house in New Hampshire as a vacation home. We were fascinated with the possibility of having a, a unique sort of section that combine a living room in the upstairs with a dining room kitchen in the downstairs. This was upstairs because it had great views of the woods. Um, so we didn't do the typical putting all the bedrooms in one level, but we did more like a crisscross in the program itself. The site also call for sort of hugging the grounds. So we also bend the building slightly as a way of making it sit better in its context. So we thought of the staircase almost as a stitch between two, the two levels. And the staircase as the stitch, then we thought of it as delaminating the wall and actually sort of creating a gash within the body of the building. That gash then becomes sort of like the signature element of the building and the one that begins to give you a clue as to how the program is stitched in the interior. So the system of construction that we deployed was uh, relied quite a bit on digital fabrication it's very similar to the way that you put boats together, just that in this case, these elements were pre-cut, uh, CNC routed, and then brought to the site. We think of programming multiple ways, not just something that you can label with a function. We also think of programming in terms of occupation, the idea that you may actually take the space out above, the, above, above somebody's head, you know, the headroom, as a way of producing a particular figure for a building. Again, very similar to uh, the way that you may actually assemble a boat. Now, as we were working in the project and we were started working with the configuration of the interior and between the tension between the configuration of the in the interior and the figure of the exterior, we started thinking of using a material that would actually allow us to sort of em embrace the body of the building. And we very much talk about buildings in terms of them being bodies. We were originally working with copper, and then this was around 2000. The market uh, took a dive, and we had to reconsider the budget of the building, which for me was actually a godsend. I think copper would have been the wrong material. So we actually decided to work with rubber roofing. The least expensive uh, of materials is $1.32 per square foot. So as a way of value engineering the project, but still working within the idea and actually making the idea stronger, um, we thought that that was a very good direction. 
So the question then became, if we're working with a material that is more like a fabric, then why treat it as if it's a building material that you aggregate? Why work with the notion of cutting windows? And instead, we decided to work with a more flexible system that will take advantage of its qualities. This was a period in time where we uh, were quite obsessed with tailoring techniques. And I looked at, for example, the impact of, impact of the sewing machine on uh, the design and fabrication of garments. And we looked at over elaborate uh, dresses and sort of the dilemmas in their patterning when you know, fabric begins to overlap. We used this as a guide for understanding how to build mock-ups in the office, and we, we built uh, about uh, mock-ups that were about a third of the final scale, um, and then the builder actually built a full-scale mock-up on site. Now, what is interesting to me is that the, when we were designing the project, we were consulting with the rubber roofers, and we were consulting with them as, as the means of understanding the techniques that would be necessary in order to translate it into a skin system. When it came to build the project, the roofers decided that they were not gonna warrant the assembly, and that, and as a result, the, um, the general contractor had his carpenters build the wall themselves. So the work of the rubber roofers really ended at that point, and then you can see the work of the carpenters below. Now, this is of interest to me because it means that we actually had amateurs building what I consider to be a quite sophisticated uh, skin system. So how to open a gash, how to actually fold that fabric so that it behave, he behaves more like a piece of clothing became the um, subject of research throughout the project. It's at the end of the day not very different from what we do with boats um, and how you wrap fiberglass around a boat, except that in this particular case, you don't care what the seams look like because you know that you're gonna be applying um, a paint coating on top and a paint finish on top. For us, and if you ever paint a rubber, you, rubber roofing material, you know that it cracks and it looks really nasty over time. It was important for us not to paint it. Um, so the placement of the seams became paramount. So we did something really low tech. We just plotted it full scale in our office and it was used by the carpenters as a guiding mechanism for the cutting. So more recently we have been experimenting with similar techniques but a very large scale. Um, we were commissioned by a developer to design a soccer stadium in St. Paul, uh, Minnesota. And one of the mandates from the client was that the building have a singular image despite this very heterogeneous program. One of the things that we came to learn very quickly is that if, they, if historically stadiums have been about the game and then the bleachers around it, today, the game is actually the least important component of the building. The, what makes the, the project profitable for a client is actually the myriad of other uh, programs that have, be, have to be inserted within the building itself. The site was really tough. It's on a slope. You know, normally when you play ball, you play ball flat. It's also urban which means that you have to have, which means that the client really wanted retail around the perimeter, and so did we. But it also was visible from a highway. So its image from the highway became something that was carefully considered. Also, there is a public plaza south of the building, so the view and the connection to the public plaza became quite important. And then the conventional issues of a soccer stadium, which is egress and access for you know, the spectators. To make matters a little bit more complicated, we actually were within the landing path of the airport, which meant, <laughs> I know, <laughs> which meant that our ceiling height was delineated by a distance to the landing path of the plane. So it became a three-dimensional envelope problem. 
Very early on, the client uh, asked us to insert a hotel within the boundaries of the project. And that uh, program actually displaced a number of, um, uh, displaced a lot of the seating. We knew because of the flight of the planes that we couldn't add it on the east side, so it became added on the west side. And it made for very sort of strange and complicated joints between different programs. In addition to that, we added um, a clinical facility for like health, sports health. We also had to add um, a, a typical um, health club, um, in addition to, as I mentioned, the hotel, and then a number of, uh, and then retail around the perimeter. So you can see that rather than a typical stadium that repeats the sec same section throughout, we actually ended up with a stadium that had multiple sections because of the pressure of the program into the building. So the figure of the building is very much the result of the configuration of the interior, but it's also the result of the pressures that the site from all angles is putting in its exterior. So the skin was conceived as a flexible system that could re respond uh, with dexterity to both the internal and the internal pressures. So for example, as a way of marking the relationship to that plaza, the stair sort of sneaks in and allows the public views of the game from uh, this particular framing device. Views became extremely important, views to the sky, views to the game, views to different fields that are on the east side practice fields, um, as well as views into and through the health club. So we worked with a shingling system because shingling systems provide the flexibility to move smoothly um, from one kind of geometry to another as we were responding again to this site and programmatic pressures. The other advantage of shingling is that it allowed us to expand the uh, system so that from the hotel rooms you wouldn't have to look through cladding. The cladding can actually part as a way of looking out. It also allowed us to respond to different kinds of geometries, wh geometries whether it's concave or convex. Um, it allowed us, for example, to pinch and as I just said, expand. So this sort of slumped figure of the stadium, um, one could describe it almost in a hyper-rational way according to every one of the program elements, but it can also be explained in terms of the slipping and sliding of the large-scale perforated metal panels as they move around the building. Now, I think we have a certain fascination with other disciplines, and in particular with disciplines that deal with this tension between exteriors and interiors. And I, this is the, the second time that I talk a little bit about tailoring and fashion. This is a dress by Paco Rabanne. And the beauty of the dress is that you still recognize the figure um, underneath it as the figure moves and changes, and this is pretty simple. It's a translation of sequence, and I, I I don't know how many of you are familiar with sequencing dresses, but there's t they tend to be very small, and what he did is that he made it gigantic while still allowing it to have flexibility. For us, this was the size was important because it was based on a floor height, but it also was based on the size of a window in a hotel room. So the tectonic unit was not based on conventional size of shingle. The tectonic unit was actually based on the size of a room itself. Now, in the case of the Paco Rabanne dress, they're hanging from each other. So that wasn't very helpful because it didn't give us flexibility in terms of when we needed to turn a drastic curve or when something needed to be bunched up. So we looked quite a bit at Korean armors and how the Korean armor is actually pinned to an under, a leather underlayment. And this kind of pinning is what allowed us to actually turn corners uh, in a quite drastic way in some cases. We, 
one of the elements that really has an impact on the elevation is the circulation on the west side that connects all of the seating uh, down to the street. And that was one of the moments that allowed us to test, to really test the geometry um, of the building. I'm sorry, the geometry of the skin. Now, we've also been quite interested in what I describe as aggregated assemblages. We've been interested in the notion of developing fields that are flexible, um, and fields that are flexible without necessarily agglomerating into a, a recognizable or understandable image. Um, many of these investigations have been based purely in, um, on technique and the techniques available at our disposal. I talked a lot about, uh, I talked a little bit about digital technology in terms of the MoMA project. It has been one of my obsessions and one of my academic um, research, um, one of the focuses of my academic research. And it really has moved fluidly between our practice, my research, and then back from research to uh, practice. This was a project that we did very early on at the Graduate School of Design. We were asked simply to design the furniture at the offices of the school, and the school had just acquired a CNC router. router. So Nader and I collaborated with a um, student that had just graduated, that, um, and this project is very much a collaboration with the student as a means of understanding how we could manipulate the surface um, of these drawers simply to allow the hand to pull the drawer open. We also became fascinated with working against plywood. Um, plywood being a natural material that is mechanically transformed. And the idea that digital technology would actually allow you to bring a certain level of handcraft effect to a material that again, that is natural, but somehow te techni technologically manipulated. So we worked in this case with the carving um, as a way of exposing the different layers of the plywood and creating almost the effect of a topographic uh, map. And we were able to actually model the layers to the point that we knew exactly what effect was going to be produced. So the pattern actually was quite calibrated and um, calculated. Now, in um, 2004, I, <coughs> I got a grant from Georgia Tech Institute of Technology to um, spend a year at Georgia Tech doing research, and my proposal had to do with digital technology. At the time, Georgia Tech had what was called the Advanced Woods Product Lab, and it was the only place in the United States where they had a five-ax router on a school uh, of architecture. And what was fascinating is that they actually were not using it with students, they were not using it in studio, they were not using it in workshops, and my coming to Georgia Tech um, really gave me an opportunity to experiment with how to bring students, the classroom, into um, a digital lab. The, um, so I did five installations with students across campus, I'm gonna show some of them, uh, just to talk a little bit about the lessons that we learned and how then that translated into a way of practice. So in this particular case, we were working with the idea of slumping acrylic ac against a form. And the form for each of these uh, tectonic units was the result, of the, the result of grouping together just 10 different cuts, 10 different sections. So the intent was to produce variation um, out of very limited number of elements. Uh, um, well, while still creating the impression of endless, the impression of infinity. In this other piece, we were working with the notion of casting and how to use digital technology to produce formwork for concrete and limiting the form to actually something, um, limiting, limiting the form to a very small number of, uh, of pieces. So in this case, working with seven and testing to see how complex a geometric one could make. We were interested in this case in the tectonic unit not actually needing, needing, to, needing mortar, 
So the units were developed to the size of, uh, to the size being small enough that two people can lift it, me not being one of them. And the joint that you see here, um, here goes out and then in, and then in and then out, which meant that when you completed the overall geometry, the units were locked uh, in place. We'll see if I have a better image. No, I didn't have a better image, I apologize. So it goes back to this notion of the configuration actually making the figure, but in this case, the configuration being the result of the tectonic unit as opposed to being the result of the program, where the whole actually needs the piece in order to make sense of itself. Another test that we explore was this very simple installation of a skin that ran from the top of the um, atrium all the way to the bottom, and it was done very simply with CNC router pieces um, and then assembling on site. What was exciting for us is that the piece, we didn't need any scaffolding. The pieces themselves were designed so that they became the guide for the next one to come. And we did this very simply um, by cutting the tips so that they interlocked with each other and simply numbering, simply numbering them so that DD50 became the guide for DD51 and so on. So I like showing this image because it describes it sort of it, it un, undoes the myth in my mind of digital technology. We made a mistake in the um, in the joint in, in this in this line of joints. We actually flipped it when we drew it, and which meant that it cut got cut backwards. And it means that one piece actually did not interlock with the other piece, which meant that we had to actually go and cut the tips of all of these joints one by one with a little saw. <laughs> and then they had to be hand stitched with metal staples. Now, the reason I tell the story is because I think in contemporary discussions about digital technology, there has been a lot of criticism about digital technology as somehow removing the hand of the designer. Um, and this actually has been almost an attack against scripting. And I have for a long time been arguing that digital technology does not remove the hand of the designer. If anything, the hand of the designer has to be all the more present because it allows the development of very complex systems that were not there before that actually require the acuteness or require the designer to be awake at the wheel. So this project in particular became very much the guide for a restaurant interior that we did in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. The, the, what we learned from the research became then the guide for how to transform an existing space. And what you're looking at here is an exploded axonometric with uh, a structural system, an existing structural system, an existing mechanical that service the spaces above the restaurant, um, and how to insert a new element that will then completely transform its character. Very simple, CNC routed. We developed a universal joint that didn't depend so much on um, its orientation, so that if by mistake we flipped it, it will still uh, function. So the shape of the space, which seems rather whimsical, is actually the result of the pressures from the um, elements above it, or elements such as this wine uh, storage within it. The system was developed to allow for sprinklers, to allow for lighting, again, to allow for the mechanical elements to go through it. So an element such as this one, for example, is because there was an air handling unit right on top of it. Now, we have become known quite a bit for being obsessed with pieces and obsessed with the aggregation of multiple elements, which produces a particular character for a project. So when we were commissioned by this client to uh, design a dining hall for them, 
um, we decided to take this on as an opportunity to shift gears. And I consider this project as very important in our practice because it really became a turning point, um, at least for me personally, away from this obsession with the aggregation of texture and aggregation that, of, of elements that produces um, sort of repetition. And instead, um, the focus really went into how to sort of have the most minimal and the most um, basic assembly system that force you to confront all of the different mechanical systems that are normally placed on a ceiling and actually force them to behave in ways that they may not want to behave. So lighting, um, microphones, um, um, gosh, supply air, return air, all of them became um, sort of contained with, within a three and a half, is it three and a half? I'm forgetting. Yeah, three and a half inch cap. Sprinkler heads. This is the project um, uh, under construction the, la the last few days. Now, what is interesting, of course, is that despite our best intentions of making the most minimalist and the least, uh, the project that is least about aggregation, the world does not work that way. Any element, of course, is the aggregation of elements, and those elements are normally geared towards the size of a human body because humans build buildings. So the ceiling that I just showed is actually panelized. And we worked with two panel types, one that receives an acoustical material, and then another one that is just simply stuccoed over. The acoustical material has a particular look that is very similar to stucco, but it's not like, but it's not identical to stucco. So we actually decided to work with two kinds of finishes for the stucco, and you'll see it better in the next picture, um, as a way of creating a variation of three and actually hiding the presence of the uh, hiding the presence of the acoustical material. We developed the pattern with a script, and the script allowed us to uh, design the ceiling so that no two materials will touch each other more than once as a way of creating the maximum variation within the system. Now, what is interesting to me about the project is that the placement of the lines in space, which again seems whimsical, is actually the result of the negotiation between what is required for a sprinkler grid, what is required for a mechanical system grid, and how those two actually needed to connect. So it's really a question of connecting the dots in between. Now Scott talked about the Rhode Island School of Design Library. Um, and for us, it was a very interesting project in that it allowed us to bring digital fabrication uh, to our practice in a very robust way. We were asked to intervene on a 1920s uh, space that is in the National Reg Register for Historic Preservation. And the first thing that we found when we were given the commission is that the program did not fit. We had thought originally that we could just simply place the program within the existing balconies in the uh, in this northern side of the space, only to realize that no, we will need to populate the space with, um, with objects. The other thing that was interesting is that during the interview, the librarian announced to us that she felt that the book was dead and that the library was dead and that books would actually disappear over time. And this became a, a very interesting point of discussion. It's odd for a librarian to say such a thing, but what is even most intriguing is that this is, of course, an arts library. It's Rhode Island School of Design, which means that it's not just a library. It's, the, it's also a, a rare book collection. It's also a place where students go to open books and actually copy from books. RISD still has a, um, a very um, sort of conventional way. In their early years, they have a very conventional way of teaching students by imitation. So it became an interesting sort of a point of departure for the project and something that really got us thinking about 
the problem of disassembly. And I started teaching a series of studios at the GSD called Disassembly Required. Precisely looking, as Scott was describing, at the problem of construction as something that may actually not be permanent, but construction as something that may actually be temporary, and maybe something that should be uh, temporary. So very simple project, two pavilions in the space. Um, we wanted the pavilions to keep good company with the 19th century uh, hall. Very tall, uh, remarkably tall ceilings. Basically, we woke up every day thinking that this is a great, easy project as long as we don't fuck it up. <laughs> so the, um, the space also is at the bottom of dormitories. So we thought of it as being sort of the living room for the building. The entire sophomore class of the entire college uh, lives in the building above. Um, so functions like uh, gatherings with bleachers and again sitting in the space itself became drivers for the architecture. The seated pavilion also allowed us to go to the top of the object, which meant that it gave you a completely new and a completely different point of view for the space itself. And you can see how we design the top in a flexible manner with very large tables that are also movable as a way of allowing students to really engage the books in ways that otherwise um, they wouldn't have a chance in their own dorms or in, dor in the residence halls. We, um, we th this project was, is important for us because we convinced the client, um, or I should say, we were convinced from the beginning that the only way that the project could come within budget and on time was actually by working with digital fabrication. And clients tend to be very reluctant to work with digital fabrication. They think of it as experimental, and they think of it as gonna be more expensive, it's gonna be too complicated. Um, but somehow this client really came on board uh, with us. It also meant for us that we needed to we needed to develop a different delivery uh, mechanism. So our 3D, uh, our three-dimensional drawings really became the guide for the fabricators to fabricate the pieces, which meant that our construction documents were really just manuals for assembly rather than actual measured drawings. And you can see how there is not a measurement in this sheet what you see here is the labels for each of the pieces and how they're supposed to join to something else. So we developed the project as a series of blocks that will be pre-cut and then pre-assembled off-site and then brought to the site in pieces and then assembled very quickly on the site itself. It also became for us, the project became for us an opportunity to work with notions of mass customization. I was very interested at this time on uh, universal design. Who is familiar with this term in the audience? Okay, very few people, I'm surprised. Universal design is actually a critique of the Americans with Disabilities Act. The Americans with Disabilities Act think of things of people as able and disabled. Universal design argues that we should think of people as having a various range of abilities, which means that it's not simply about physical fitness, it's also about age, it's also about stage of life. Um, and for me, this is a very powerful way to take a look at the human body. When you look at graphic standards, graphic standards argues for the average, this is the page from graphic standards, and as designers, we're constantly designing for an average, and there's always discussions as to whether it's the average male or the average female, and graphic standard gives you both. Um, so digital technology, in my opinion, becomes an opportunity to actually work not with the average, but with the many. And we use this almost in a didactic way in the way that we design the computer stations in the perimeter of the, um, circulation island, so that we worked with the smallest height for a table for a female, seated female, 
and the tallest table for a standing male, and then we did everything in between, almost as a didactic register of the different ranges for the human body. Now, for the study, uh, for the study carols that flank uh, the other island in the space, we were a little bit more subtle. We worked with different heights of tables. We worked with different widths of tables. We also worked with different heights of the benches um, and also different widths of the benches as a way of sort of giving multiple occupations and multiple users um, equal importance with the intention that over time somebody may actually find their perfect spot or their favorite spot when you go to college or in college for four years, five years, depending on the program. So there's a great chance that you actually will be a repeat customer. And as you test the space around, you may actually find your favorite uh, place to study. Another um, aspect of mass customization was the idea that we could bring all of these different elements to the site. The machine doesn't care what shape it cuts. What really mattered was assembly. So we develop each of the units as a repetitive system so that whoever is assembling it, assembling it didn't have to guess. It has the same number of units. They all go together in the same way. They're just different shapes. It also became a way to um, characterize the installation as different from uh, something you can buy off the shelf. The librarians were very keen on placing the names of artists and writers around the piece, um, but they couldn't get their act together in time to actually give us the list of the names. So what we did is that we developed an alphabet, and the project got prized with an alphabet so the fabricator told us that we had enough budget for 32,000 32, characters, which meant that the librarians had to come up with a list for 32,000 uh, characters. And it's been quite interesting because the names in that, as you move around, that the names uh, also include um, alumni of RISD, and then they play jokes on all of us so that the names of the team members are, you can find throughout. Um, I was also expecting a baby when I did this, so my daughter's name is embedded in the piece, <laughs> as is my dog's name, for example. <laughs> okay. How am I doing with time? <laughs> so the projects that I have shown have tended to show surfaces um, and have sh tended to show surfaces in tension with the volume, the inside of a building itself. The next two projects that I'm gonna show, and then I'm gonna stop, really deal with a structural system and the tension between um, sort of a particular morphology and a structural system. We were commissioned by B British Petroleum to reclad an existing uh, gas station in um, Los Angeles and one of the dilemmas for us is that we needed to bring it up, bring it up to uh, code by actually extending the canopy where you see these uh, red dashed lines. So the ultimate figure was really the result of extending that existing structure to be able to hug, if you wish, the new requirements by code. One of the things that I feel very lucky that we had is that there was an existing billboard in this uh, gas station that put a lot of pressure on the figure not to go beyond a certain boundary. We were also asked to think of this as a system that will be, could be repeatable and a system that could be repeatable in other cities and in other sites. So working with uh, parametric software, we actually developed a single column type with the idea that that column type could change and be modified depending, again, on the pressures of the site or the pressures of the program. So the intention is that this typical mushroom column could actually transform, be modified easily in terms of its uh, shape 
and that depending on its location, whether it's on the edge, in the center, um, or whether it has to be narrow to allow for traffic on both sides, or whether it has to grow as a way of holding the cashier's food, that the same system could actually flexibly be modified. So as a result, that single uh, element then again grows in order to hold the cashier's food. or is squished because of it is at the end of the site, <coughs> or becomes almost like a billboard on the street itself. So for me, there was something unsatisfactory uh, with the Los Angeles project in that it was clouding around an existing structure. Uh, so I felt that there was something strongly limiting by that mere fact. So when we were commissioned to design a border crossing uh, between Maine and Canada in uh, the town of Madawaska, we took this as an opportunity for exploring the idea of developing a structural system that could be flexible and adapt to a site um, and a very complex program. Um, so it's an interesting, it's a strange port of entry. If you know anything about port, port of entries, the, this really should have been right here. Normally you cross and you immediately have the port of entry, but there was an existing building that the government didn't own. So we end up with this odd, elongated approach towards the site itself. The other thing that is unusual is that the site is in a very, very steep slope. And if you know anything about ports of entry, especially in a case like this that there's a lot of snow, we actually needed to level the areas where the cars were at. Um, so when we were originally given the commission, I, you know, it's a first government program project. I wanted to make sure we would get another government project in the future, so I did a dumb box. And I was very excited with our dumb box, except the traffic engineers told me that your dumb box does not work. And the reason it didn't work is because we really needed to have the traffic really follow the contours of the site, and we needed to terrace the site. So as dumb as I wanted to make it, as complex as traffic engineers ended up making it. So what is interesting, and I won't bore you with the, all of the details, but what is interesting is that the shape of the building is really the result of all of the vehicular traffic requirements on the site itself. Retaining walls are extremely expensive, so we worked to minimize the changes of level on the site and be as subtle as we could. Um, so working with Landworks and taking clues, uh, Landworks Landscape Architecture, and taking clues from the site itself as a way of minimizing um, retaining walls, the, the presence of retaining walls on the site and just using uh, <coughs> this kind of stone retaining system. The problem of the slope also became a problem in terms of our interior. We could not make a building that was flat. The building is actually, um, it, it had to have a slope in the interior. So this is actually a terrible thing for a uh, border crossing. The officers like everything to be in one level. But for us actually, since this was a small border crossing, we took it as an opportunity. So we, ended up connecting visually the commercial uh, checkpoint with the POV, privately owned vehicle checkpoint. Um, because at night actually you only have, in a, in a facility this small, you only have two officers uh, working the facility at night and it was important for them to have a visual connection. So the slope actually helped in, ex in, in actually um, facilitate the visual connection over the uh, material in the space. Conservation, extremely important. The shape of the building, um, I try several times to straighten it and have a, have a sort of a frontal approach to the building. It was not possible. The conservation really led to the kinking of the geometry as a way of seeing what is called secondary uh, and seeing primary from the interior of the building itself.
Now, from tip to tip, the building is 800 feet long, and it can be only 12 feet tall. So you can imagine what a long, skinny pancake um, this building is. And it's a very low budget, it's a, it's a government building. So we decided to work, oh, I'm sorry, but then the canopies needed to be 16 feet tall, uh, 16 six. So we decided to do, to do a very simple gesture, which was to just produce a crenellation to the profile of the building as a way of giving it some interest, as a way of giving it some relief. Very modest um, approach towards the, uh, toward, very modest approach towards the scale of the building. And the intent was that that figure will unify not only canopy, but also the building itself. So we developed actually two geometries, one a simple um, gable roof and the other one a mushroom column. And we worked with the notion of transforming one into the other, but also transforming the different figures so that they can actually flexibly respond to the requirements of the site and the requirements of the program. So, there we go. So what would have conventionally been um, simple roof over the main building and a simple uh, mushroom uh, canopy over the, um, over the inspection area became then modified and, and adapted uh, to the site itself. And I think I'll stop here. Thank you. And I really love questions, so I, I will really welcome questions. strangely has given me more flexibility in terms of schedule because I'm not teaching anymore. I used, you know, studio really used to drive my life, which meant that I, I didn't, I don't like missing studio when I teach. So I have very rigid days of the week that I would work in the office versus not work in the office. Being dean really has given me flexibility in terms of the schedule um, because the day to day is very different. I don't have to be in, you know, I, I don't feel obliged to be in studio per se. Um, I think it has also made me think about broader issues and has made me sort of zoom out and take a look at a broader context and a broader agenda. You know, the practice of architecture is sometimes very minute. You know, you're looking at how to connect a rod to the tread of a stair, right? And that can be a very sort of focused, narrow slice of reality. So being a dean has allowed me to, re uh, not only allowed me, but forced me to really look at the big picture. You know, what does that road connect into that rise that actually mean in the bigger uh, context? The fundamentals of architecture is drastically changing. Yes. And you said that we're going to see its effects in these couple of years, and you said that it's going to be very fast. Yes. Um, what do you? Um, what is your vision about that, or what do you exactly mean? Okay. Um, it's it's not a simple. It's not a short answer, um, but I'll try to give you examples. It used to be that the difference between what small research-based practices did and what corporate firms did was really great. It used to be that you would understand a corporate practice, you would see a building and you'll know who did it, right? 
and it was markedly different from what a smaller, more experimental practices did. And what the smaller experimental practice did really was ahead of what corporate practices were doing. In other words, for things to go into the mainstream, normally it took 10 years. And what we were doing, what people were doing in academia made it into the smaller practices. And you saw the result between what you did in studio with your students make it into practice at the smaller scale and then 10 years later maybe made it into a bigger scale. Today I see a mainstream sort of taking the research that we do in academia or in the smaller practices and exploding it into the large scale right away without any transition. Which for me makes me think about the problem of the critical. What does it mean anymore to be a critical practice? Because now the world around us is sort of all looks the same. The big practices use the same techniques as the smaller practices. And the smaller practices use the same techniques as the bigger practices. So, it, you know, for somebody like me who was educated at a time where you thought of architecture as a um, criticism not only of culture, but also of the practice itself. There was a difference between what I did and what SOM did, right? Um, this kind of rapid uh, transition from one scale to the other that is happening today is a huge, huge change. So that's one category. And I think it's gonna make it even harder for uh, your generation because how to distinguish yourself from those who are coming before you is gonna be even more difficult. So that's one category. The second category really has to do with technology. And I know it's not necessarily popular these days anymore to talk about technology. But the truth is that the construction industry is changing rapidly. We do not build buildings today the same way we built them 15 years ago. And I see changes happening faster and faster and faster and faster. Um, which means that the conventional tools and the conventional techniques that we have been teaching in school, I don't think are going to suffice. I really think that the exposure to technology of the younger generations is very, very important. The dilemma is that one very quickly, one very quickly um, sort of falls back into talking about the technology itself and the work becomes about the technology itself. And I don't think technology in itself is sufficient to characterize architecture. I don't think architecture is only about technology. I think that cultural representation is still very, very important. I mean, for me, RISTI is an important project um, because for us, multiple alibis were significant. I, I do think that um, sort of developing a new delivery method was important. It was a critique of the discipline. It was a critique of the profession. But to do it so that we could work with principles of universal design, for me, is fundamental. In other words, it's not just form for form itself. The form had different interpretations, different intentions. You know, how to accommodate different sizes of the body is one explanation. I mean, my partner will describe it completely differently with a different emphasis. Um, so I think that that's another challenge that your generation is gonna face, that the tools that we're teaching you in school by the time you graduate may actually not be the ones that the, the profession will have advanced at a rapid, um, at a much faster pace than when we were uh, in school. And I'm one of those that was, did my undergraduate by hand and my graduate digitally. So I saw that transition. I actually see the transition now even more radically, radical, particularly in the building of buildings. Um, so that's another category. And then the third category is that um, there has been a lot of discussions um, about the crisis of architecture and architecture somehow being uh, for too long self-contained and obsessed with form and not somehow caring about um, real world problems. And I think that that kind of critique and that kind of commentary actually is misplaced. I think that architecture is about form and that that's what we do. We materialize uh, culture. And if, if we give up the power of form, I think we're actually locking ourselves into a worse dilemma. 
Um, that doesn't mean that we should not engage broad cultural problems. I actually think broad cultural problems need uh, architecture to be part of uh, the solution. So that's yet a third category of how I see the discipline changing rapidly. We've done tremendous disciplinary advances, advances in terms of geometry, precision, form making. I think now we need to make sure that they don't get thrown under the bus in, for the sake of cultural relevancy, because I actually think that's how we become culturally relevant. We can do things that others cannot do, let me put it that way. <laughs> so. Other questions? Please. Thank you. Uh, my question is about digital technology, because nowadays uh, the technology has become a strong tool. So we used to design buildings, but now we design the tools to design the buildings. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but then uh, there's a common situation, which is uh, once we run these tools, it brings something out of your expectation that happens, right? Mm -hmm. Then it leaves us two like uh, scenarios. One is we totally deny it, we ignore it because uh, it's not something you design, but it designed. Uh -huh. So it's very kind of, it brings a basic question, what is design? So uh, another one is you kind of post-rationalize it. Yeah. So so-called it's uh, inspirations. And uh, yeah. so, uh, so basically my question is, what do you think about uh, digital t technology and uh, what do you think, where, uh, no, 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 where do you think it, it is taking us to? Okay. Right. So I drew by hand for many years before uh, digital technology came, uh, came into the discipline. So I actually think you are uh, mistaken when you think that digital technology is um, allowing chance to happen more often than the tools that we had before te digital technology um, came to the field. The same kind of chance, and anybody that drones or has drawn by hand can testify to this. The same kind of chance that happens with digital technology used to happen with our hand techniques as well. Um, and we used to make choices very similarly. I mean, sometimes you decide to divide by two when you're doing a module, or sometimes you decide to divide by four when you're doing a module, and you decide to divide by three. Three or two is very different, but you, you have to make a choice, and some of it is random. And again, this is, this is why I've been thinking about architecture more as a question of approximation. Um, I actually think the opposite. I think that digital technology is allowing us a level of precision that was not possible before. The, the same amount of chance that happens now used to happen before. So I do not agree with this perception that somehow the hand of the architect is removed from the technique because it's digital. I actually have another concern regarding digital technology that is not about chance or no chance. One of the concerns I have about, about digital technology is that we tend now to design in three dimensions and we're no longer using orthogonal projection as a design tool. And why am I concerned about this? I'm concerned about this because in the Renaissance, architects design, before Alberti, architects design with models. And they would build a large full-scale model of a building, and that became what the builder used in order to build the building. The invention of the Renaissance was actually to cut slices through drawing. And that's an abstraction that allows you to understand form in a way that the actual thing doesn't allow you to understand. And digital technology has made us more propense to design like that, and then slice it, as opposed to design through the slice. So I actually think that designing through the slice was an advance, and we now may be taking a step back. Um, it's easily correctable, so I don't think it's the end of the universe. Um, I think that the more that we are aware of the difference between you know, one technique and another, um, we can then go back and not disregard the idea of the slice as a design tool. But it's, a, you know, it's an abstraction that I think was important to the creation of space. And not to work in plan and section and elevation, 
actually gives up the power to think abstractly in that way. We're thinking in a way too factually. Um, so that I'm much more concerned than the problem mm -hmm. of um, the problem of sort of chance happening um, it, one technique over another. Please. Looking at the, the difference maybe between uh, the aesthetic of the cafeteria project and maybe the aesthetic of the, um, the gas station project, how do you make a decision between uh, kind of geometric form or a more smooth form? And I'm curious, are you interested in things like uh, blobs or are you more <laughs> interested in the kind of geometric? You know, um, it's a great question. And it's a very personal question, actually. The, um, we made a decision very early on that we were not interested in a signature style. And, but, but almost by chance, we ended up developing a signature style. So when we were asked to design the space that has the white uh, surface, for me, it became very important to do a project that would critique, in a way, all of our practice. And that would speak of aggregation not as the aggregation of particulars that are identifiable, which is basically what we've been doing, um, but that would actually force the aggregation to be conceived in a way that it will disappear, that, would it, that will make disappear the particular. Um, so so as, a, as a practice for me, uh, personally, I find that intellectually stimulating to position our work vis-a-vis -vis others and vis-a-vis -vis other conversations. Um, but then also to self-reflect and be able to be critical of our own work as well. That's why I consider that project a, a sort of a pivot point because very consciously the decision was made to not pursue aggregation but to actually pursue a smooth surface. Um, now we had a great collaborator in that project. We were working with uh, Gensler and they are the kings and queens of knowing how to do things very precisely and working with the smooth. So I thought of it as a great opportunity uh, to do that. Um, and it was also appropriate for that program and for that client. So a lot of our techniques come from, the, they're opportunistic. They come from the opportunity at that point in time. Like RISTI was a client that listened when we talked about digital technology and then we went with it, right? Another client may have said no way and no matter what I did, we couldn't convince them. At least they went with it. So, so a lot of our techniques are sort of opportunities. The MoMA project, we sort of looked at each other and we said, you know, we're never gonna be able to do something under sheet steel, so let's use sheet steel. Um, so in that sense, I think we're, we're closer to the ideology of somebody like Rafael Moneo or somebody like Tom Main, who tend to want the work to be eclectic. Um, and not necessarily self-referential. And I, I think that despite that intention, we tend to fail. We are still end up with things that are identifiable, um, even though we try to change the technique constantly. It's almost like we can't escape ourselves in a way, so. <laughs> Going along with that theme of having a body of work, for the gas station project, it was a client who specifically asked how that one design could be used in multiple locations. So how do you reconcile this corporate need for like a big box mm -hmm. uh, stamp, pretty much? The, what was interesting what is interesting for me about the project is that for us, it didn't translate into the big box. It actually translated into a unit that will transform. So the shape of the gas station will always be different as opposed to the shape of the gas station always being the same. I mean, the, the conditions that we had in Robertson and Olympic, the two, that is, that's the intersection in LA, I don't think we'll find them anywhere else. It's sort of a very strange placement. And we designed two more after this that were not built and they were completely different from each other even though they used the same tectonic system. And something I didn't describe because I think it's a little hokey, um, but others in my office like describing is that the actual pattern of the mushroom came from the Helios uh, logo of BP, the actual number of segments, et cetera. So it's almost like a subliminal 
reference to uh, the client, but always with the notion that it will be distorted, that it will be modified, that it will be repeated not as, um, as a precise image, but repeated more as a technique. In your, you know, hi history with the all the conventions that you use, that you're use, you know, you started out hand drawing, you come from RISD, the, the, that background. I think one of the, the, the things I would I ask. Actually, I didn't go to RISD. I'm sorry, I apologize. That's all right, no, no, no. But, but, uh, but, I, but in, in that background, in the answer to the digital question or the state of the digital art, especially given your position at Michigan, do you have parallels or make discoveries? that are as powerful or as potentially powerful as the abstraction of plan and section from the Renaissance? You're, I mean, or mm -hmm. is there no one single thing but there's a proliferation of anything? Because it seems to me many yeah. of the techniques oh, sure. that are in play right now yeah, sure. are just as abstract, but perhaps there's a, another intuition or another uh, sort of gaming of the system that, that, that or abstraction yeah. methodology that, 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 that is changing that you, might. Oh, for sure. The, the, um, I, and as I was saying before, I think digital, digital technology has allowed us to be more precise than ever before. So again, the white uh, ceiling, the locations of the sprinklers were determined by the mechanical engineer, the locations of the um, return air and supply air were determined by the mechanical engineer. It was through parametric modeling that we were able to produce the splines that connected them. And it was through uh, parametric modeling that we were able to actually then do the, the sort of changes in angulations to each of these things. These things are rectangular, these things are um, tubular, et cetera. So absolutely, the, the, um, the kind of control that one can have by working on the object in real life, I mean, in real size, three-dimensionally, is something that we didn't have before as well. My, my, what I lamented when I was talking about the orthogonal is that we become so fascinated with the 3D, with the three-dimensional, that we have somehow abandoned other techniques that are just as important. Ask me a more precise question, yeah. Yeah, because I, I have a, a similar kind of concern that you have about the role of abstraction today, mm -hmm. but also like what is the new abstraction? Like what is the, what replaces the plan or orthographic mm -hmm. representations as a, as, a, as a kind of, creates a distance between what you're thinking and what you're actually producing, whereas the object is kind of, it is what it is. Yeah. <clears throat> so I guess my question would be like more it's not, I, I don't agree, but I think it's the same distance. I actually, the three I think they're both the same distance. But you're saying it's not abstract, though. It's, it's, a, it's a different kind of abstraction. It, it translates something that is volumetric into something that is more analytical. It's more of a slice. So. You mean the, the 3D or the section? The section. Right. No, I, I agree. Yeah. I guess my question is very direct. Do you think parametrics is the new abstraction? And what I mean by that is that parametrics is about association, yeah. not what it is. Yeah. So is yeah. that possibly a new yeah. kind of abstraction? It's, it's, it's another form of abstraction, yes. Yeah, I totally would agree, yeah. Is that what you mean? <laughs> the 
creative force behind yeah. it. But after so many years of working, if you were to describe your, your agenda as an extrovert, and would you want to? Would you want to describe that? Mm -hmm. Very hard. You know, very, 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 very early on, we were talking about alibis, and it's something that I still believe in. I think architecture has to have multiple alibis. And I like the word alibi because it implies, you know, an alibi could be, a tr it could be true or it could be a lie. You could be lying, but it's still an alibi, right? So I, I do think architecture has to have multiple reasons, multiple forces, and those, those um, tend to be external to the object itself or the external to the, to the project itself. And you're still making choices. You know, one could describe the same exact programs and the same exact site conditions and the same exact reasons and yet end up with something else. So that, that still does not um, somehow excuse you as the author of the work. You are still present in the work despite sort of our desire to remove ourselves as authors. You're always present in it. Maybe one more. I had a question about, um, you started with the idea of approximations and mistakes and how naturally what we start intending doesn't match up with what we end up with. I was just wondering how your feelings have changed about mistakes. If you get the same feeling in the pit of your stomach now when the joints don't align as you did back then or how your feelings about tolerance have um, changed in, in how you practice, how you approach tolerances in your practice. I definitely still get the same feeling in the pit of my stomach. <laughs> we, I walked into that white ceiling space and uh, we had three levels of plaster, the acoustical one which is very rough, a medium one and the smooth one. The smooth one was shiny and it's still shiny. And everybody tells me it's fine, everybody tells me it's not a problem, <laughs> everybody tells me it looks good. I have to tell you I almost went in and like sanded the damn thing myself. So very, very difficult, um, very difficult. But by the same token, I do, I do think that, I do find that intellectually satisfying to work with the problem of the more or less and to work with the problem of tolerance. And when we started out, we were working with 16th of an inch tolerance, which is insane. Um, and now the idea of understanding the size of the tolerance as related to the size of the project and what you do with those gaps and those crevices and those joints, for me, is actually a, a fascinating uh, problem. So that many times you design something knowing that it's gonna be built crooked. And how do you design it so that that crookedness is either part of the intention or not noticeable at all because of the way that you, that you do it. So, so on the one hand, I think I've embraced the problem of construction more uh, by accepting tolerance as something that has to be variable uh, in size and, and in um, sort of uh, approach. But I still haven't gotten over the fact that when something is built incorrectly, it bugs me. So. Okay. Thank you very much. You guys were great. Thank you. The questions and answers are always my favorite part.